morning when uh, I was on my bike ride with my dogs, we had not gone far and I kicked up a hen turkey and one poult that was with her that I wouldn't call it a juvenile. I guess in human terms, you'd call it a toddler, but it could fly. Anyway, I let my fields grow. I just cut paths through them so we can walk through them and ride our bikes through them. I just let them, let them grow because I don't, I'm not a farmer. I don't grow anything in there. So I try to give the wildlife habitat. Deep grass is hab- good habitat. It's, it's a good sanctuary for birds and snakes and insects and turkeys and all kind of critters like to get in that grass and it gives them cover. Uh, we kicked up a turkey. Uh, it was a hen turkey and she had a baby with her and the hen went one way and the little, man, this little poult could fly this thing flew off in the pine trees i mean the last time i saw it it was still gaining altitude normally the turkeys will level out at some point and they'll they'll hit the ground but this this thing just kept on and on and it worried me that i had split up a hen and one poult now you have to expect that a a hen is going to hatch a clutch of at least three sometimes four maybe five eggs I don't know what the survival rate on small turkey poults is, but it's low. It's very low. They're susceptible to predators until they can fly. And until they're old enough to get away from a predator, the mother will act as a decoy sometimes. Most times she'll just fly off and leave them. But she only had one, so I'm assuming that uh, two or three, maybe even four, have been either died or been caught by predators, and it worried me that I had split this hen and her poult up because they went in two different directions. And I can only hope that the hen will call that poult back to her, that baby back to her. And I'm I'm almost 100% sure she'll start calling for that poult. They're probably already back together now. This just happened 30 minutes ago. Anyway, I pay attention to things like that. On our walks and rides, we see all kinds of wildlife almost daily. One day, a couple of weeks ago, I was riding a different route, a different set of trails. And let's see, we saw the turkeys are split up now. They're not together. The hens are off raising their babies. And the hens that don't have babies, they're grouped together. But the hens that have babies are uh, solitary. And they're just raising their own hens. And they'll start grouping back up in the fall. But I saw... um, a mother with four poults. Five minutes later, we kicked up a coyote. My little hairless dog chased it. <laughs> I was trying to call him back because those coyotes would just tear those little dogs up. But luckily, he came back. And I think it's a coyote that I have been seeing for like the last two years. I don't kill coyotes. I don't. That's a whole nother topic. But I leave them alone because if you kill them, there's just going to be another one take their place. They're such a hardy and robust animal, probably the most persecuted animal in the history of wildlife. And they still, they have never gone down in numbers. They only thrive in new habitats. And so I leave them alone. I just leave them alone. And sometimes they take wildlife, but so do dogs and uh, so do cats. So I leave the coyotes alone. Anyway, we saw a coyote. That was really cool. And then Like 15 seconds later, I was coming out under a canopy of oaks and pine trees onto a levee, and this giant, it's one of the biggest herons I've ever seen, must have just launched from the top of a tree, and as it was swooping down into the pond, I'm assuming to start feeding, it saw me, and it flared in front of me about Maybe 20 feet in front of me, I got the most beautiful view of this heron. And oh, I wish I'd had a camera because I could see all its colors and I could see the definition in its feathers. And of course, it saw me and it picked up and it flew away. Now, herons and egrets are some of the most wary birds in the world. You, You cannot get close to those things at all. And if you're a duck hunter... You would do well to stick a heron or some of these egrets in your decoy spread because they're confidence builders. Anyway, that's another topic, but we used to do that. I don't know if it worked or not, but we killed a lot of ducks over those spreads when we would stick a heron or something that looked like a heron, 
especially something white like these white egrets. We kill a lot of ducks over them. Anyway, went a little further, got up on another levee, and there was a snapping turtle going across the levee, and we just, my dogs are smart enough not to mess with a snapping turtle. They sniffed it, and on they went, but I sat there and watched it for a little while. Now, it quit moving. Snapping turtles, if they see a human around, they just stop. They're ready to fight. I just watched that snapping turtle for a long time. Went a little further on the levee. We saw a big cottonmouth snake. Uh, and I think that was it that day. It was one of the best days of seeing wildlife for me, uh, really all this spring and summer. But every day we see deer, coyotes, we see something, some kind of reptile, some kind of fur bearing animal. And I just love it. Okay, so that's a long, that's a long story. That's a long intro to this email that I got from Jeremy. This is not a cryptid story. I just had a few minutes this morning before work and I thought I would go ahead and record the story because it's really good. It's not, it's just things this guy who is tuned in and he's, I'm sure he's teaching his son this. He's tuned into nature and he's still got that wonder of a kid when he sees animals in the woods. And that is so healthy uh, in my view. I'm that way and I feel so lucky that I'm that way. That when I see things, it's almost like I'm. If I've seen a heron a hundred times, uh, to see a heron again, and we have they're everywhere around here in the egrets. It's it's always like the first time, you know, and it just takes your breath away to look at this wildlife. Well, this is I can tell reading this man's email that he's the same way. So I'm going to read his email. I'm going to sign off. It's a little different podcast, but. I just felt like doing it. So I hope you guys enjoy his story and you feel the sense of wonder and maybe you will get out. I don't, if you live in a city, just get out in the park and look at the squirrels, watch how they behave. And it's, it's amazing how animals have learned to survive in urban areas and uh, some urban animals, even like dogs and cats, which I can't stand cats out there, wildlife killers. Your cat is a wildlife killer. You may say, oh, my cat's sweet. No, nope, your cat's go. If you let your cat out, your cat is killing birds, bird after bird after bird just for sport. That's what they do. But anyway, even cats and dogs can learn to go from urban areas, wilderness areas, and they learn to survive. Now, some of them can't. I know some of them can't, but some of them do. So anyway, the behavior of animals is, uh, and without getting too scientific and, and, and reading all about them, et cetera, et cetera, to me, they're just fun to watch. They're more fun to watch if I don't get real scientific with it and just watch how they, how they operate. It's just cool. It's peaceful. Anyway, I'm going to read his email and I'll shut up and you guys can move on with your day. If you're still listening, I know I ramble. These things just pop in my mind. So I say them, I'm, Sorry if it annoys you, but here's the man's email. He writes, my name is Jeremy, and first off, my son and I love your show. He asks nearly every morning when I get in my truck if there's a new Dixie podcast. Now, my stories are not cryptid stories, but they're interesting nonetheless. Now, I love to hunt, and I've been hunting on my own since I was 12. I'm 43 years old, and after years of working as a large animal vet tech, there are mornings that I feel a hard and abused 90 years old. The last five years, I've hunted the same spot on our land in Breckenridge, Texas. Both of these stories happened last year. The spot that I picked to hunt is nearly perfect. There are two main trails, and I call them I-45 and I-20. The large oak tree that I sit in stands right at their intersection. I don't sit in a blind or a chair. I sit on a Y branch that's a little over 10 feet off the ground. From that tree, I've had game that I passed on, and it stood within 10 feet of me, and they never know I'm there. And man, is that fun. A young doe and her fawn jumping and bucking and spinning like a bucking bull on a frosty morning, or the ridiculously fat squirrel who came by and got within inches and stared at me for several minutes before barking once and waddling off. I like to get to my spot well before legal light, and my walk to the tree is only about 300 yards, but it takes me quite a while to get there because I'm slow, and I go slow as not to make noise and spook any game that might be bedded down close. 
The first story happened not long after I got to my spot and had climbed into the tree and settled in. Dawn was still an hour and a half off, so I laid back on the branch and I got comfortable. It was quiet, and the insects and the night birds were not very chatty, and I heard a clicking sound like something was tapping on the rough bark of the oak tree not far from me. I looked around without moving my head, and I didn't see anything, so I just blew it off. But it kept happening. And it was always in a different place, but always in my tree, and it was close. I was getting ready to sit up and see what in the hell was causing that damn tapping, slashing, scraping sound, and then I saw it. It landed on a branch I had broken off the season before to get a better alley to shoot through. It was perfectly silhouetted against the starry sky. It was a small owl, about eight inches tall. Well, I nearly laughed out loud. It had been trying to figure out what the hell was lying on the tree branch. He had been going from spot to spot and trying to get a good look at me, and when he landed, he was only four feet away, bobbing his head up and down. Now, I knew owls made little to no noise when they fly, but this little guy was flying and landing around me for 20 minutes within feet, and I only heard his feet grabbing the tree when he landed. It was so cool. The next story happened a few weeks later on, on an afternoon set. Like everyone who has land, we all hear coyotes yipping and howling, and we know what they sound like. My dad had on more than one occasion that year, and since, he's been sitting on his porch having a drink when the coyotes start going off. And then a long howl that is not a coyote would sound and the coyotes would go quiet. Well, I joke that we could have a wolf. Texas does have wolves, and in certain places still has a few though it is rare. Not long after, I was enjoying a beautiful afternoon sitting in the tree during hunting season. There was little wind and there was lots of sun and the temperature was in the mid-40s. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught movement. It was coming toward me from the east and I started to slowly turn my head and my first impression was that it was a huge coyote. Holy crap, that coyote is massive, I thought. Sweet buttery Jesus... It is not a coyote. It was 25 yards away when it froze, and it sniffed the air, and then it turned to its left and headed north at a trot, all the while looking for whatever had spooked it. Now, I would put money on it being what is called a Mexican red wolf. Now, the Mexican red wolf is a fairly contested species, with some scientists arguing whether it's its own separate species or a subspecies. Well, this canid was about 40 to 45 pounds with a slightly darker coat than a coyote. And its face was a little different as well in that it was a little bit wider. It was a gorgeous animal, and I'm hoping what I saw that day was a Mexican red wolf. Thank you for your channel and keep up your ways of off-topic rants and an inability to pronounce the names of locations. We're Southern Rednecks, and we say it the way we want to. God God bless you and your family, Jeremy. I don't know. Have I? I must have that reputation. I don't know. I just, some things I can't pronounce, and I, maybe I've gained a reputation for not being able to pronounce some things. But if you've never heard it before, and it's spelled kind of funky like most of the... Look, travel through Mississippi. Almost every... I bet you... 60% of the towns and counties in Mississippi are some Indian native name. And I guarantee you, you can't pronounce half of them. We live here and we can't even pronounce them all. Or we say them wrong. That's a fact. Anyway, I just love this email and I felt like talking. So half of this podcast is me talking and half of it is his email. But I appreciate Jeremy sending it. I remember when I was in my 20s. Now, I've told y'all I'm a city boy. I am not a country boy. I was born and raised in metropolitan Memphis, Tennessee. And even though we did go hunting when I was little, we weren't country people. Now, all of my ancestors, starting with just my grandparents, they were country people. They were from Mississippi, and they all came up through the Depression and even before that. And they were farmers and 
you know, and then the Industrial Revolution comes along and people start getting jobs in cities, and that's how we became city people. So I kind of had a country person influence, but I'm a city boy. I'm not a, I'm not a country boy. So when I was younger, I was hunting. Uh, maybe I was probably in my mid twenties. I was hunting at my uncle's place somewhere down around Coldwater, Mississippi. He had just clear cut his land and he had built these shooting houses. They're just they're just little four foot by four foot boxes with a window cut in them and a old metal chair stuck in them. Maybe some old carpet put in the floor to keep your feet quiet while you're sitting in there moving around waiting for a deer to come by. Anyway, I was in one of those shooting houses. I kept hearing this sound on the back of the shooting house. It was something crawling on the back of the shooting house. Well, I had no idea what it was. And being a city boy and not really, you know, <laughs> I had not been in the woods that much. So I wasn't used to all the sounds in the woods. I am now because, I, because I'm out in the woods every single day. But I wasn't then. And uh, I couldn't figure out what this was. It's almost like Jeremy's story about the owl. There were gaps in the walls you know, to the outside on these shooting houses and anything, anything that could squeeze through there could get in. And I just happened to look up over my left shoulder and look at a sound. And it was one, I don't know, I think they call them sugar, sugar flyers or fly. They're little bitty flying squirrels is what they are. And they, they'll fit in the palm of your hand. And there was just one of these little sugar, sugar, I, I can't remember what they're called. Sugar, sugar flyers maybe, but it was just, it was latched on to the vertical wall of the shooting house and it was upside down and it was had its head cropped up just looking at me and I thought the first thing I thought, holy shit, that's a vampire bat. That thing's gonna that thing's gonna eat me up. And I started with the barrel of my rifle trying to trying to stab at it and trying to get it to go out, but every time I would do that it would just move. It's like I could not could not catch this thing. And eventually I could not get it to go out, so I just eased out the side right by it, and it never moved. It just watched me. It moved its head as I went out, and I quit hunting that day, and I was telling my uncles and cousins about it, and they were just laughing their heads off at me because I thought it was a vampire bat. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, uh, it kind of goes along with Jeremy's email, and I'm not trying to one-up him at all, but it just reminds me of these stories and that's what we do. But I here's what I appreciate. I appreciate Jeremy's wonder and the capacity to notice beauty and funny and fun stuff in nature and put it in a fun light. And that's why I read this story. So I know this is a different podcast, but it's my podcast. And by God, I think I can do whatever I want to when I want to. And so that's what I wanted to do today. All right, I'll have another one up here in a day or two. Hope you guys are having a good week. Fourth of July is coming up. Everybody be safe. Don't drink too much beer. Drink drink as much as you can stand and don't drive and don't let a firecracker blow your finger off and have a good time. Hope you eat a bunch of barbecue and chicken and hamburgers and people out camping and stuff. I just hope y'all have a great time. We're going to have a nice Fourth of July. I love you all and we'll see you on the next podcast. Thank y'all.